This is the day the Lord has made. Almighty and eternal God, our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for bringing us together this morning at this hour and this day. We ask that as we feel your Holy Spirit around us and within us, that you fill us with, hear our voices, fill us with that spirit, renew us, restore us again, so that as we leave here this day, we will be better able to meet the challenges of this day and the coming week. This we ask and pray in the name of Christ, our Lord, who taught us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures. Almighty and gracious God, we ask that you bless these gifts and that we may use them 
for the strengthening of the ministry and the lives that, we're, that we can touch with these gifts, that more and more will come to know and to love you through your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. morning. Uh, the scripture lesson today is from Exodus chapter 14 verses 19 through 31. Then the angel of God who was leading the people of Jerusalem, Israel uh, moved the clouds around behind them and it stood between the people of Israel and the Egyptians. And that night, as it changed to a pillar of fire, it gave darkness to the Egyptians, but light to the people of Israel, so that the Egyptians could not find the Israelites. Meanwhile, Moses stretched out his rod over the sea, and the Lord opened up a path through the sea with walls of water on each side. And a strong east wind blew all that night during drying the sea bottom so that people of Israel walked through the sea on dry ground. When the Egyptians followed them between the walls of water along the bottom of the sea, all of Pharaoh's horse chariots and horsemen, uh, but in the early morning, Looking down from the clouds upon the array of the Egyptians and began to uh, harass them, that the chariots' wheels began coming off so that their chariots scarred along the dry ground. Let's get out of here, the Egyptians yelled. Jehovah is fighting for them and against us. When all of the Israelites were on the other side, the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand again over the sea so that the walls, the water will come back over the Egyptians and their chariots and their horsemen. Moses did, and the sea returned to the normal uh, beneath the morning light. The Egyptians tried to flee, but the Lord drowned them in the sea. The waters covered the path, and the chariots and the horsemen and all the army of the Pharaoh uh, ceased after, chased after Israel through the sea, but one, but no one remained. The people of Israel had walked through on dry land, and the water had been walled up on either side of them. Thus, uh, Jehovah saved Israel that day from the Egyptians and the people of Israel saw the Egyptians die, washed, the deaths washed up on the sea. When the people of the Israel saw that mighty miracle the Lord had done for them against the Egyptians, they were afraid and feared the Lord and believed in him and in the servants of Moses. This is the word of the Lord. When Israel came out of Egypt, the house of Je this is a responsive reading. When Israel came out of the house of Egypt and the house of Jacob from a formed a people of foreign tongues. This dominion. The sea looked and and fled, the Jerusalem turned back. The mountains mm -hmm. skipped like rams, the hills like lambs. Why, uh, why was it, O oh sea, that you f fled, that the Jordan turned back? Why was it, dear mountains, that you skipped the rams, the hills like lambs? Troubled, O oh earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob. God turned the rock into a pool, the hard rock 
and to his spirit so forth. Glory, Glory be to the, to the Father, Father, and the and to Son, Son, and, and to, to the Holy Ghost, Ghost as, as it was, was in the beginning, beginning is as now, now and, and ever, ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning to all of you who are here today, and good morning to those who are online as well. Glad that you have come here uh, this morning to worship together. The prayer list is in your bulletin, so we do want to keep uh, those persons in our prayer, especially the family of William Saunders. Uh, he was, uh, his service was this past week at Oakland Christian. Before we have our morning prayer, let us take a moment of silence to reflect upon the blessings of God and to turn our hearts and minds, opening them to his spirit. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, indeed, this is your world. All nature sings and carols ring 
the music of the spheres. And part of that music is within our lives. For into our lives you have given us a song to sing, a song of Jesus, a song of salvation, a song of the Spirit. And it is that song that brings us together. It is that message that comes to us of love that we open our hearts to. And this morning we open our hearts to those who are on our list of prayer. Some who are here with us, others who are unable to worship with us. There are those who are sick and in need of healing, and there are those that mourn. So we lift up all of these to your care. We lift up those who were in places far off, those places in the continent of Africa where there are many coups taking place and people's lives are displaced once again, and there is fear. We think of those who were in places such as in Canada, Newfoundland, Maine, who have been afflicted and affected by a hurricane for this morning, they are putting their lives back together. Persons in Maui who are still dealing with a terrible tragedy of fire, which has displaced hundreds of people, many families and businesses, and has brought much hardship to that whole island. We lift up those who in Morocco their homes crumbled by a powerful earthquake. There are so many things in our world, gracious God, that we see the hand of creation, but we also see the hand of your love. So we pray that for those who are there in those situations, who are being the good neighbor, we pray and uplift those hands and hearts that from a distance are able to be good neighbors through their donations. And in all times, we give thanks for all those who call upon you through their prayers to fill within those who are afflicted your spirit so that they are not overcome with dread and fear, but that they will be able to rebuild in hope. Continue to bless us and our neighboring congregations in the ways that you will, in the ways that you have, that enable us to meet the needs of those in our community, to be in good fellowship with those who worship with us, and to serve you in word and action. All this we give you thanks and praise in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. The gospel lesson today is from the gospel according to Matthew, the 18th chapter, beginning at the 21st verse. Peter then came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him, began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back. 
But he refused. Instead, he went off and had that man thrown into prison until he could pay his debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant? just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will, be, will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. This is the word of the Lord. Almighty and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. My father used to tell a story about uh, don't kick the cat. And as I was thinking about this, I don't know if this was a, the passage that he used that illustration on, but it all had to do with a man at the office and he's having a bad day and so he he yells at his secretary and the secretary that ruins her day and she goes out and she's going home she is there at starbucks and wants a cup of coffee and they deliver it wrong but she's driven away and now she's upset and she goes and and she goes to the grocery store and has it in with the grocer and the grocer goes home and he has it in with 
with, uh, on the way home with the paper boy who threw the paper into the wrong, into the bushes, couldn't get that. He called and made the paper boy mad and the mother of the paper boy mad and she screamed at the paper boy and the paper boy saw the cat and just kicked the heck out of that cat. Horrible story, isn't it? But life happens. Life happens. And what we do, we just carry it on and on and on. It's a challenge some days, a challenge. And I do want you to know I updated that because when Dad told this story, there was no Starbucks. <laughs> Forgive as forgiven. Who benefits most from forgiveness? This is the question, really. When Jesus is dying upon the cross and he says, Father, forgive them. Who benefited from that most? We benefited quite a bit. But it is the forgiver who benefits greatly. Because to not be forgiving means you're holding something that is like luggage that's just dragging you down. It doesn't give hope. It's more of a dread. Remember that commercial? What's in your wallet today? Today's question, what's in your heart? Because that's how it ends with, with that almost horrible passage from, from Matthew that really slams the disciples. Unless you do this, <laughs> you're going to see some bad things. It's what's in your heart. What's in your heart that's important? It's always interesting to me when I first sit down in the first of the week and I read the scriptures that are in the lectionary. They have been used for years and years in the same order. They've only changed once in the last 40 years, but there is a reading for every day of the, month, of the year, four readings actually. And so every three years they switch to a different set of readings. And so as the years have gone on, I try to think, well, did I preach of the gospel last time or was it one of the others? And then I try to switch it up. So I'm not preaching the same thing every three years. Not that I really expect you to notice that, but I care. But there are moments when I look at the passages and I go, okay, I don't quite understand how that Old Testament passage relates to the New Testament passage, to the gospel. How in the world does the story of the slaying of the Egyptians in the water and that the Israelites went through on dry land and they're safely on the other side, what is that about forgiveness? What is that all about? Anybody? <laughs> it starts with Pharaoh. How many times did Moses and Aaron, they're standing before Pharaoh and he says, the Lord says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, no. And so then there's the Nile turns to blood. There are locusts. There are all sorts of dreaded things that are happening. And each time the Pharaoh, he, he, he wants to relent, but he doesn't until finally his son dies. And all the first sons die. And he relents. But it wasn't in his heart to let them go. There was no forgiveness. Because soon as they had left town, he sends his army out there. And God, in the scripture, says there was that pillar that had been leading them out that moved between the armies. On one side there was darkness, on the other side there is light, and they didn't go together. And in the light, God parted the waters, and upon dry ground they were able to get to the other side. And when they got there, there was light for the other side, and they began to go across. But the ground was no longer dry, it was soggy. Their chariot wheels were falling off. They could tell the waters something was going on until finally they said, we got to get out of here. 
we got to get out of here. If the armies had been captured and they had been taken back to Egypt, we can reasonably assume that Pharaoh would not have said, all is forgiven, let's go back to normal. I would imagine instead he would have said, you thought it was bad then, <laughs> you wait till tomorrow. It could get worse. There was no forgiveness of the heart. There was no dealing with anything except that the power of God was being shown in full force. But for whose sake? For the sake of those who had been rescued and brought upon the dry land and taken to that land of promise. So that when Peter asks Jesus, how often should one forgive his brother? Seven times? And to me, it has a question mark at the end, and it sounds like a question, but as in many times in Scripture, a question is just one that it, it says, I want to have a discussion about this. Not that I don't really know what my answer is, because I think Peter, being Peter, wasn't ready to be rebuked, so he was giving that if seven, if the number seven is perfection, and God created in seven day and rested, then this must be the best answer I'm going to give. Seven days. And Jesus says, <laughs> 70 times seven. Perfection times perfection multiplied, multiplied. Why? Because Jesus is essentially saying, always forgive. Always forgive. And then he tells a story. But see, before this question came up, in the earlier passage, if your brother sins against you, go and speak to him about it. And if he doesn't do anything about it, then take someone else with you. And if he doesn't tell the, tell the community about it, if he still doesn't do anything about it, and he still isn't going to right the wrong in any way, then treat him like what? A tax collector. Just let him live. Just let him go. Doesn't seem just. But it goes with this next passage about forgiveness because Jesus is telling them, look, quit trying to find ways to burden yourselves. Life, as I get older, life is too short to be fighting about things of no eternally importance. We're here we could be gone today or tomorrow and have eternity. We don't need the burdens of the past, especially those who you know you're not going to change because there are those people in this world who just know what they know, and they are like they are. And when Jesus was approached by these people, he recognized it, but he didn't cast them off to their evil. He merely told them, it's okay. Essentially that you are who you are. The rich man who comes says, I can't give up everything. Well, then don't. You're not ready. Paul, who was Saul at the time, and he is, he is out there gathering up followers of the way, killing them, watching Stephen being stoned to death. And then he gets struck and realizes, boy, did I miss the boat on that one. Because God sees in us there is that chance for change. But that's up to God. That's not for us to have to be burdened by. In our own world, no matter whether it's in our own lives, in a corporate life such as the church, we pray for God will be done, isn't it? And in that same prayer, we pray, <laughs> forgive as we are forgiven. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who dead against us. Not easy, but that is what we ask for. And that's what Jesus is telling the disciples, this is a reality. Let God be burdened by it. You don't need to be burdened by it. 
as a history major, there are many moments in history where we have been called to remember something. You know, the word, the, 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 uh, the uh, shot heard round the world that began the American Revolution. Remember the Alamo was the cry. Remember the Maine. Remember Pearl Harbor. Remember 9-11. And those here in this generation, remember COVID. And every generation will have something that people say, we want you to remember. But is it to remember what out of that? That we should be aware of our surroundings. Maybe there was a way that the main didn't have to be sunk. Maybe there was a way that the Alamo, and now that the history's, history, historians have revised the story of the Alamo, I'm sticking with the old story because it fits me better. <laughs> it was those Mexicans, it was them were the enemies, you know. Uh, Davy Crockett and, and the others, yes, they died there. The historians say no, but I'm, you know, the only disappointment I have with the Alamo is when I went to see the Alamo, it was not anything like I expected. It was a museum. It wasn't some, I wanted to stand on the ramparts. You know, I wanted to pretend I was, you know, in that war. Because that's part of remembering. Remembering what went on, what was the characters, what were the situations, what brought about such a disastrous thing. But then many actually call out for remembrance during that moment to strike up fear. And we saw that in like 9-11. Anybody go and buy duct tape from Home Depot and Lowe's? Because we were told that that would keep out the, the dust of some sort of poison that was supposed to float around that a terrorist was going to get us all with. And I'm thinking... <laughs> Who's going to take that tape off and wash my windows? That's, you know, how long is this going to last? It was just fear. It was fear. And I would say that even today, we still haven't dealt with that fear. We haven't dealt with what brought on that attack. What caused such pain? And so we move on. And more... Frightening things happen in our world. But it is still a world of God's, his creation. And there are two lines that came out to me. The Egyptian army, when they realized what was going on, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. The Lord is on their side. I would say that most times the bad knows what's bad. They know that they're fighting good. They just don't want to not fight. And so if we go about and we are not forgiving as we have been forgiven, we are burdened. And if that gives anybody joy, it would be that person. It would not be God. And we would not benefit from it. The other is the people fear the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, God's servant. Because it is about putting trust in God. Letting God be the one who makes that just decision. Let God deal with that. And let us move on and be unburdened. Jesus Answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. That's a lot, which means I hear you're asking the question, but the question, the answer is obvious. Just forgive. That's what's going to do it. This is how my heavenly father will treat you unless you forgive from the heart. That's that last statement. So much of our faith is upon the heart. In fact, all of it's really upon the heart. Isn't it interesting that in each of our Bibles, the passage John 3.16 is not underlined, it's not bold, it's not with a special color, but it is the most known, most well-known passage of Scripture. 
because we remember it. Because it says who we are and what we're about. But is that word belief in him? Because the devil believes in him. Evil believes in him. But evil is not saved. But belief is from the heart. It is how we are most like God in Christ is our salvation. And what does God expect of us? Because God knows us better than anybody else. God says, this is the level at which I want you to try. <laughs> aim for this. We may fall short, but aim for that. Let us be forgiven as we have been forgiven. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks that in times of great challenges, you do not abandon us that we can put our trust in you and have hope for today and tomorrow and for all days ahead because you will not disappear. You will not abandon us. Gracious God, help us in our lives, in our words, in our works, in our ways to be good witnesses of your presence, of your forgiveness, of your love so that burdens are indeed lifted and that because of the cross and our burdens being lifted from us, we will always know the assurance of our salvation. We ask this in Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us join now together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Those who are able, please rise and receive the benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us this day and forevermore. Amen. I 
sing. 